Good afternoon, and um, thanks for coming along to this talk about uh, a software update for the Internet of Things. Uh, first of all, the, we've had some slight problems with the projector, so the, um, the aspect ratio of the uh, screen isn't quite right, so everything's a little bit squashed. It looks better if you download the slides either from the link I'll give at the end or if you go to the eLinux uh, website uh, and download it from the events page there. Uh, skip that. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm a uh, freelance professional trainer and author. Um, this is a really good book. I highly recommend you go out and buy a copy because, let's face it, I need the money. Um, and you can also contact me um, in these various places. And I'd be very happy to link to any one of you on LinkedIn or on Google+. So, uh, this talk then is about a uh, software update in the world of the Internet of Things. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, actually Matt Porter gave almost exactly the same presentation yesterday, uh, which is a bit of a surprise to me. So, um, I've changed uh, the emphasis of this slightly. So, this is now less of an overview of the various uh, open source projects, because Matt did a very good job of that. Um, so it's a little bit more of a tutorial on what goes on underneath the hood and what makes a good update mechanism, I hope. Let's start with a scare story. Uh, so why do we need, uh, why, why is this a, 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 an important thing? So this happened uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, a virus or a, an attack called Mirai. Uh, created a huge 600 gigabits per second DDoS uh, on a couple of websites. And the reason this is scary is that the attack vector of this was very simple. Uh, Mirai just looks for open telnet ports, uses a well-known set of usernames and passwords, and then gets the shell, and then does evil stuff. And uh, the, the prime target turned out to be this particular uh, webcam, uh, which just happened to, have, happened to be shipped with an open telnet port, and most people never change the username or password, of course. So uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing we need to, uh, to protect against. So I've, ended, I've identified two problems we're trying to solve here. Uh, the first is the one on the previous slide. Uh, we have bugs in software. All software has bugs. That's inevitable. But now that we're connecting everything to the Internet, uh, those bugs become a lot more available to anybody who wants to take advantage of them. So that's the prime problem that I think we, should need, that we need to focus on. But there is also a secondary problem or opportunity, depending which way you look at it, um, it's quite handy to be able to update devices in the field, to add new features, maybe even add new revenue streams, et cetera, et cetera. So conclusion then, anything uh, or many things that, that, are, that are shipping that are connected to the Internet, uh, we really need to have some mechanism for updating them. So you're out there now, and you're all trying to choose a software update mechanism. Uh, what are you going to be looking for? Well, obviously, you want uh, whatever mechanism you use, you use to be secure. We're trying to increase security, not reduce it here. So that's an important concern. Um, robust. We don't want an update to brick the device. That's not really achieving the aim either. Um, atomic. Uh, so by atomic in this context, I mean that uh, you either apply the update or you don't apply the update. But it shouldn't be possible to have a system which is halfway updated and then it reboots and then it fails to work. So atomic is a, is a big important thing here. Uh, fail safe. So even if things do go wrong, we want to be able to recover and get back to a 
uh, at least a minimal working system. And the update itself needs to preserve the persistent state of the device. Great, thanks. Okay. Can you hear me still? Not if you can't. Thank you. So what are we going to update? Um, so this is a, 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 a diagram showing uh, the main components, components of a, an embedded system, bootloader, kernel, root file system, applications, ranged against, uh, on one side, uh, the frequency that you're to, likely to want to update these things, and on the other axis, uh, how easy it is to update. Uh, the main conclusion from this diagram is that the one component that's really hard to update and is therefore not usually updated is the bootloader. Uh, the other components are increasingly easy to update. Certainly the root file system, certainly the applications need to be updated. Um, it's quite possible the kernel needs an update as well. So just to reiterate, I'm talking about updating everything but not the bootloader. That is a constant. Why not the bootloader? Well, the problem is that there's, the bootloader is usually a single point of failure. If you get an interruption whilst trying to update the bootloader, the chances are it won't boot again. It's very difficult to have a redundant bootloader. The next question is, what are you going to update? Um, so file, package, container, image. So just going through those, um, updating a file at a time seems like a, a, a trivial thing to do, but it turns out that file-based update mechanisms, uh, it's very hard to make them atomic. In other words, if you have a group of files that need to be uh, applied as part of an update, it's difficult to make that atomic so that the entire group either are, are either updated or not. So file update doesn't actually work. Uh, package updates. So we've been uh, running Linux distros for decades now. Um, we update a Linux distro by using apt-get or yum or whatever uh, you may have. Um, but it turns out that package updates also are not atomic. So in reality, they are not an option for embedded devices. I'll come to that on the next slide. So that leaves us with either container or image. Um, so containers are a neat idea. Um, the idea there is uh, borrowing on the work with um, container systems such as Docker uh, on uh, cloud services. Um, why not apply the same technology to embedded devices, make your application into a container, and then we can just update the entire container in one go. And using the magic of Docker, we can do that fairly atomically uh, and other similar systems. Um, I'm not, oh, actually, I do have one example of a containerized update system, which we'll come to at the end. Um, but most cases, it comes down to the bottom option here to do whole image updates. So do an update of the root file system as a block. And that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, let's come back to this package thing, because this keeps on coming back. People keep saying to me, yeah, all you need, I've got 10,000 Debian servers in my data center, and I can update all of them with a single shell script. Well, that may well be true, but a server running in a data center is not the same as a device sitting on the top of a mountain or at the bottom of the sea. It's a different uh, use case. So whereas servers are in a nice secure environment, they're kept at a constant temperature, uh, the power and the network are protected and are unlikely to fail. And if they do uh, fail, there's always, uh, they're always accessible. Somebody can walk around and plug USB sticks into them. Embedded devices, they're different. They uh, have intermittent power. They can be powered off at any time. They have intermittent network connections. Uh, um, um, if you're using mobile data, uh, the, uh, 
link can easily go down at any time. They have low bandwidth. And in the case when the uh, update does fail, uh, it's not a simple question of just walking around a nice cozy room to uh, do the reboot. You've got to go to the top of the mountain or to the bottom of the sea to update the device. So this is why I say app to get update doesn't work in the embedded world. So looking then at image updates. There are two common uh, approaches, and they call various things. Uh, first one at the top is a symmetric, uh, also referred to as AB mechanism, where you have two redundant copies, well, you have a, a copy and a redundant copy of the root file system. And you have some kind of uh, integration with the bootloader, which I've represented as a flag, and depending on the setting of that flag, the bootloader will boot either uh, copy A or copy B, or copy one or copy two, as it actually says on the slide. So to update this, uh, you are, for example, running, uh, the live copy is uh, in OS copy one at the top. You then update this partition here. Then you reboot, having toggled the boot flag, so the next time you boot into this one. And then next time you need to do an update, you do it the other way around and you flip back again. The main uh, drawback of this, historically at least, is that it means you have to have two copies of uh, the root file system partition, which can be quite large. So it, uh, in, in the case where you have limited flash storage, it uh, eats up your flash storage budget. With the falling prices of uh, flash storage and the move to things like EMMC, that's less of an issue because Flash storage is so much cheaper now. However, one mitigation of uh, the, the amount of space you need in the symmetric uh, case is the asymmetric case. So in this, we have just one copy of the main OS, but we have a much smaller recovery OS uh, so that when we want to do the update, we boot into the recovery OS, and then we use that to update the main system partition. So this is the way Android used to work. Uh, and then in the recent uh, NuGar uh, uh, release, um, they've, at least as an option, switched to symmetric uh, update, which they are hailing as a big new feature, which nobody's ever heard of before, <laughs> except we've been doing it for decades. One aspect of doing a whole image update uh, of the root file system is that the root file system has to be stateless. Because every time you do an image update, you are restoring the state of the file system to that when it was built. So if you have uh, network config and SSH keys and other things in your root file system, they're gonna get overwritten unless you move that persistent state out to a different place. So this is something I talked about yesterday and if you're interested still, uh, there's the link to the, uh, to the presentation I did. So, the next thing I'm gonna talk about then is the update agent. Uh, so we need something that's actually going to apply the update. Uh, sorry, let's go through this story in, in, in sequence. We need to uh, receive the update from somewhere. It can be from local storage, USB, a thumb drive, for example, or it can be pulled from a remote server somewhere. Then we need to apply that update, in other words, write it to the appropriate partition. And then we need to twiddle the boot flag and force a reboot, so the bootloader will then boot into the newly downloaded uh, system. So I'm going to look at um, two uh, open source image updaters, uh, starting off with SW update. Uh, so this is um, a, a classic, uh, if you like, 
Uh, I'm not sure if I've used the word classic for something that's only existed for, for 18 months, but nevertheless, let's use it. A classic image-based update client. Uh, you can go and get the code from here. Documentation is here. And this is uh, maintained by Stefan Babbage, who is sitting in the middle of the audience right there. And this was the first, or at least as far as I know, uh, the first open source update client uh, to, uh, uh, to become available. And it's been around for 18 months, maybe 24 months, something of that sort. So, you know, it's the, it's the oldest, uh, it's, it's the old man on the block, basically. So it supports both uh, symmetric and asymmetric modes. Of course, it supports uh, U-boot, uh, since Stefan works, uh, Stefano, I should say, Stefano works for, uh, for Dynx. Um, it does all the things you would expect. It supports uh, raw NAND flash you, um, uh, using <coughs> MTD. It supports UB volumes, and it supports regular uh, file systems partitions using normal uh, partition formats. It has in, some in, uh, integration with the Octo project. There is a meta, uh, meta uh, SW update uh, layer, uh, which will help you build systems for software update. And amongst other things, it will build you uh, the recovery OS uh, image as a, an init RAM disk. Um, it uses uh, curl, I believe. Uh, to uh, pull in updates from remote systems. And it has uh, integration with a thing called Hawkbit. Uh, we'll come not actually to Hawkbit, to, but to uh, the, the other end of the, of the, of the uh, sequence. If you are doing remote updates, you kind of need something to control um, the servers that control the updates. And Hawkbit is uh, one mechanism for doing that but I'll come to the whole remote update thing in a few slides time. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm gonna say. Uh, if you want a little bit more detail, um, uh, Matt Porter certainly covered uh, this in more detail in his presentation, and uh, there is plenty of stuff at these uh, links here. Um, next I'm gonna mention the uh, uh, RAUC, Robust Auto Update Controller. Um, this uh, project started a little bit later. Um, the aims are essentially the same. It's another image-based update client. It's an LGPL license instead of GPL, but, um, and you can go and get the, uh, the code and the documentation from here. So uh, Rauk is written uh, by uh, Jan Luber, who uh, works for Pengatronics. And so it also supports symmetric, asymmetric update mechanisms. Uh, since it's a Pengotronics thing, it has good support for Bearbox, um, not so good support for U-Boot, um, and also supports uh, Grub as a bootloader. It too has uh, support for all the usual uh, partition formats. It has Yocto project integration uh, plus, it has PTX dist integration uh, for the obvious reason. Um, as well as uh, local um, updates, it handles uh, remote via st uh, streaming product, uh, but, well, using curl, and it has verification and so on and so forth. So again, this is very much a, an overview. Go and read the links on the previous slide uh, for the full details. So there is two um, well-known and operational uh, uh, solutions for the basic update client uh, component. And this works fine for the local update case, the classic man with a USB thumb drive who goes around updating each machine uh, individually. And since the uh, typically, these uh, update clients also support remote streaming. They allow you to download an image from a remote server. But typically, that download is user-initiated. 
and is user attended. So for these reasons, uh, what we have so far doesn't scale to large deployments. So the next thing I want to look at is um, the kind of current hot topic, which is OTA, over-the-air updates. And I define an OTA update uh, mechanism as one in which, in addition to the update client running on the device, we also have some logic behind that, which can manage the updates and push an update out to a population of devices. The update itself uh, can be done totally automatically, so there's no user intervention. So that's handy in the top of the mountain or bottom of the sea uh, scenario. Or it can be semi-automatic, as with your favorite mobile device, where the update is pushed automatically to the device, but you have to uh, do something to actually initiate the, the installation, the final step uh, of the process. Either way around, the, the mechanism is the same. So now we have, in addition to a population of devices, each running a copy of the update agent. We have a whole bunch of stuff uh, at the top of the diagram now to manage the deployment to those devices. So we'll need uh, some kind of update server. There needs to be some kind of communication between the server and the device so that uh, ultimately the server can push updates to uh, the population of devices when necessary. Um, in addition to that, you need uh, some uh, procedures in place for creating those updates and pushing them to the update servers. So typically that requires some kind of build system integration, uh, maybe with the Octo project or something similar. And there is a component actually not shown on the slide, uh, but uh, not essential, but very useful. There is typically some kind of management console uh, so that you can send instructions to the update server to control updates to the devices, do them in phases or campaigns or whatever. Um, and also, since you have this all in place, this is a good place to do device monitoring. So typically, there will be some kind of back channel so the device can send information uh, back to the server, and then you can see on your management console, on your update console, uh, you can see the devices that have received updates, what versions they have, maybe other status information. Okay, so the whole thing now becomes a much more complex uh, management uh, system. So this actually complicates things considerably. Since we're now pushing automatically updates to devices and potentially applying those updates automatically, um, we need to make sure, well, authentication. Uh, is the update that I'm receiving, is it legit? Is it from uh, the manufacturer? Or is it from some evil uh, hacker from uh, some evil uh, organization? Unnamed. Um, so we need authentication. Um, security is kind of handy as well. So this is different in that this is uh, basically uh, encrypting the, 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 the stream and adding in checks into the stream so that essentially, am I receiving what you're sending or is somebody in the middle changing stuff? Is this a replay attack? Uh, and so on. Um, we really need some kind of automatic rollback system so that if an update fails, we will go back to a known working system. We need, to, uh, we need the system to scale, so we may have tens of thousands or hundreds or millions of devices that we want to update. And as I said previously, it's quite handy while we're doing all this also to put in the back channel so we can get status information from the devices that we have uh, updated. So some or all of these things are what we would expect in a uh, complete 
OTA update solution. Um, just a couple of thoughts about uh, rollback. In other words, how do you recover from a partial update? And typically, there are two levels of, uh, of achieving this. Uh, so the first is to use some kind of protocol between the operating system and the, and the bootloader. And one such mechanism is the uh, boot count limit, which is in U-boot. The idea is then that uh, you increment uh, the boot count when, uh, boot, when uh, the bootloader boots. And then once uh, the operating system is up and running, you uh, run a command to reset the boot count. If, on the other hand, uh, it doesn't get reset, and, for example, it uh, cr just crashes and reboots, then the bootloader boots up, it finds the boot, the boot count hasn't been reset, and typically it will then go into recovery mode, and in the AB um, uh, image example, it will, boot, it, it will boot into the last good image. In the asymmetric case, it will boot into the recovery OS. Okay, so that's the first level of defense. Uh, but we do have bugs which would prevent that from working. If the system hangs before you even get uh, to uh, a, a point where it could reboot, if we just hang in a buggy device driver, for example, then we're never going to get back into the bootloader. So in this case, you need some hardware support, which is obviously going to be device specific. But really, we want a hardware, ro hardware watchdog uh, so that if we don't get to the point of triggering the watchdog daemon, the watchdog times out. We do a hard reset of the CPU. You can tell when it resets uh, by reading a register uh, the reason for the, for the reset. Uh, the bootloader can read that and then once again go into recovery mode. Okay, so these, things, these two things together should give you pretty hard, uh, uh, almost bulletproof, uh, guarantee that the system is going to boot, and if it doesn't boot, it's going to recover. Um, I'm going to mention two systems um, which implement uh, OTA, end-to-end -end OTA uh, update mechanism. Uh, first of all, Mender. Um, I should... Uh, probably give a bit of disclosure here. I've actually been working with these guys uh, over the last few months on their system. So I'm slightly more familiar with what uh, they do than the other guys. Nevertheless, I, uh, I'm trying not to give any bias uh, here. So Mender is a end-to-end -end update uh, server and client. It uses uh, full image systems. It uses actually a symmetric AB <laughs> update mechanism. The client component is, uh, is open source and is available here. Uh, the server component, at least currently, is not open source. No. Okay. Uh, it didn't used to be. <laughs> okay. I, oh, in that case, okay. And, and the license is? Apache 2. Apache 2. Okay, so um, can you mentally uh, scrub out this little bit here <laughs> in, uh, in your image of this slide? And I'll update online when I get a chance. Um, so that's good. Um, uh, the uh, code is available here. Uh, documentation is available here. Some of that documentation is written by me, so if you don't like it, it's my fault. Um, so what does it do? Um, the update client is uh, a classic uh, AB update mechanism. <coughs> it has integration with U-Boot, uh, supports uh, regular partitions on uh, EMMC and MMC uh, cards, for example. It has uh, rollback. 
It has integration with Yocto Project, uh, with a meta layer called Meta Mender. And the, uh, the remote fe features include all the things you need uh, to implement a full end-to-end -end OTA update. Um, the other guys you'll see at, um, uh, uh, have a booth upstairs are Resin IO. Uh, these guys are essentially doing uh, the, or trying to save, solve the same problem, uh, but in a slightly different way. So the main concept between, uh, behind Resin is that it's a container-based uh, system. In other words, your applications you put into Docker uh, containers, and then it has mechanisms to atomically update uh, those applications on your, on your population of target devices. Um, in a similar way, uh, the uh, client software is uh, open source, um, but I was speaking to them just now, and uh, at least uh, as of half an hour ago, uh, their, their server code is, is not uh, released. But they say that, that uh, they will indeed, uh, uh, well, it is their intention to release at least some components of the server code uh, when, it's, um, when, it, when it's ready. Um, so Resin, well, Resin is kind of a bit of a hybrid in that it does actually have a symmetric AB rootFS update mechanism uh, for updating the, uh, the core uh, part of the system. So maybe I should have had a diagram here, but I don't. I'll have to draw it in, my, in the air. So essentially you have, with this kind of mechanism, you have a, uh, a base OS, uh, which essentially then uh, is the host to, to Docker. And then on top of the host OS, you use Docker to load the uh, various application images. So the base OS you can uh, update. There is a mechanism called Resing Hub. Uh, um, I can't remember what the hub bit stands for, never mind. Uh, and that will update that. But that's not really what Resin is about, that's what I'm trying to say. The main functionality of Resin is to update the Docker containers of your applications. Uh, so it's kind of quite neat. It gives you a little bit of overhead on the target because you have to run Docker and all the dependencies Docker has, which expands the size of the core OS somewhat. But hey, flash memory is cheap these days. Um, it has a little feature in its um, uh, support for Yocto. You can actually build Docker images into the base uh, OS, so you can actually pre-populate uh, a bunch of Dockers, if that's your idea. Um, remote features, deployment server. Oh, it, it has a handy little thing um, integrated with Git. If you use their, their build uh, engine, essentially you can just do a, 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 Git, uh, a Git commit uh, and then a, a git push to the appropriate place, and the build server will then pick up that uh, git push, build it into a Docker container, and deploy that Docker container for you. Funky. Okay. Um, oh yeah, Umbrello. Um, I'm. Blah. I'm not going into too much detail here because I assume you already know what Android is. Brillo is just a cut down version of Android. It's essentially Android without the Java bits and without the UI bits. And it is um, one of the uh, operating systems that Google have for IoT uh, devices. So uh, Brillo therefore does the same thing as Android does. It has both symmetric and asymmetric in image update options. Um, and uh, as with Android, although the OTA update agent is part of the Google repos, uh, the server components are not, and you will have to essentially write your own uh, update server in order to communicate with these. Um, yeah. Okay, and that's essentially it. Um, so that was a quick run through uh, the, uh, the basic technologies involved with uh, uh, update. 
first of all, talking about client-only update uh, agents and uh, specifically using a software update daemon, which I've misspelled here, uh, and RAUC. Um, and then I went on to look at end-to-end uh, -end solutions using over-the-air update updaters, and I looked specifically at Mender and Resin. Oh, actually, in Brillo. I should put Brillo on here as well. These are by no means the complete list uh, I could put in, in, uh, in those, um, under those subheadings. Uh, as I say, Matt Porter gave actually a more complete uh, list of things there, so go read his presentation if you haven't seen it already. And uh, once again, uh, follow the links online. You'll find a bunch of this stuff. So we have, I think, uh, five or 10 minutes for some questions. Oh, and before you do uh, ask questions, uh, let me just point out that the slides of, uh, are uploaded on SlideShare. They're also on the eLinux uh, events page. And I have uploaded them also to the uh, Linux Foundation um, uh, 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 web thing. <laughs> but it takes a little while for, for that to percolate through. But they are at least available here. That's def definite. So, who uh, has uh, some questions? Yes. Uh, so the question is, do, how do you update the kernel, basically? Um, so the none of the solutions I've talked about have uh, a specific case for updating the kernel. Usually, uh, the situation is that the kernel uh, image is part of the root file system, or at least it is perfectly possible to put the kernel into the root file system and then use uh, U-boot or whatever bootloader to read that kernel file from the root file system. Um, if that doesn't work for you, you can always, you know, it's, it's just another image. You could actually update it in the same way as the uh, root file system image, but you'd have to do an extra bit of work to make that work. Uh, yeah, so typically in, in the uh, symmetric case, then uh, the, uh, the update client is running on the live operating system. So there's no reason why you can't uh, write the, the backup copy whilst the main OS is active. And indeed, that's one of the features of NuGar that you can do um, simultaneous updates, as they like to call it. If, on the other hand, you're using um, uh, the asymmetric case, then plainly, you have to boot into recovery mode uh, in order to do the update. So in the, in the case of your light, you have to do this at night when the light's turned off uh, for this to work. Yeah, but you don't know whether you're going to have the light on for this time. <laughs> well, buy ordinary lights then. <laughs> don't buy smart lights. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, um, it, so I, I did actually attend your, 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 your very interesting talk on um, sensing systems uh, sitting just below the waves. And yeah, exactly. So you have a computer almost at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so mm, I, I guess the answer is kind of. So I mean, it, the, using the AB uh, mechanism, your overhead is basically twice your existing root file system. So if your existing root file system is 100 megabytes, 
then you need an extra 100 megabytes of flash memory to do the redundant copy. Um, it's, you know, it's nowhere near that much, okay. unless I, I, so, I mean, the, so, it, the, the, the essential update, can somebody pull the door to, maybe? So, the, the essential overhead, uh, is the update agent, uh, on the device itself. And the update agent, even in the case of Mender, is, um, a few, 10 megs or something? Seven megabytes. Yeah. So the, the overhead's about seven megabytes. Are you saying the per megabyte file system I could I could easily make that work? yeah. So uh you know there are just cases of seven megabytes, but it does require uh the the question you know how it depends on how big your data set is. No, I think my my whole system I need about forty megabytes now, but the point is that render is only adding about ten megabytes to the image. To the root image. But um there is a bit of an a caveat here. Um, and this isn't specific to Mendo, but it, but it is an interesting uh, case to bring it up. So most of these update mechanisms uh, use fairly recent versions of the kernel and other utility uh, and, and other infrastructure. Um, uh, specifically, in the case of Mendo, it requires System D, for example. You are probably not running System D, so that would be the overhead. To, uh, to achieve that. So, yeah. So, exactly. So, Exactly. So, yeah. So that's a, so. As as Stefano point, rightly points out, the other way to do it is to use the asymmetric case, and the, the specific advantage of the asymmetric case is you only have a small recovery OS, which is typically just a RAM disk, mm, ten megabytes or something. Or you, okay, so that's an interesting. Well, I mean, to be fair, these all require a reboot, so that's not per se, a, an issue. Um, yeah, so you could use the bootloader as essentially the recovery OS becomes the bootloader. I'm not very keen on that solution myself. Exactly. So I, I, exactly, so just to, to wrap that up, I, th this is a use case and, and people do use it. I, I would not recommend to use U-Boot as the, as the recovery OS. It is a restricted environment. And also remember from one of my earlier slides, the one component we can't update is U-Boot, so, or the bootloader. So it is a good idea to, to keep the functionality of the bootloader to be minimal so as it works uh, without problems, and to put your potentially buggy software uh, outside of the bootloader. So that, that would be my, my view. But I mean, on the other hand, you have a very specific uh, case. You don't have a huge population of devices to roll out. So 
you know, anything's possible. This is software. You can do anything in software. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Otherwise, I'll do a wrap up. It's gone quiet. Okay, uh, yep. Okay, so thank you all very much, uh, and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>